The Tom Woods Show, episode 500. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. If you're interested in more libertarian podcasts, let me recommend to you the Jason Stapleton program hosted by my friend Jason Stapleton. Monday through Friday, he gives you a libertarian look at the news. Check him out at jasonstapleton.com. Tom, I'd like to congratulate you on 500 episodes of The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody, to episode 500 of The Tom Woods Show. Of course, we heard the voice of a man you will all recognize. In fact, I told him when he asked, should I identify myself? I said, nope. My listeners will have their intelligence insulted if Ron Paul feels like he needs to say, I'm Ron Paul. They all know it's you. (laughs) So it was very nice of him to send along that greeting to us today. Episode 500, unbelievable. Been going at this for about two years now, slowly and gradually building up a very nice audience. And I thank you for listening, for your kind words, for supporting the show in various ways. It's extremely gratifying. And there is more work on my end than I make it seem on the show. And it's very rewarding to know that a lot of people really are benefiting from it. You can check out everything we've done on the show at tomwoods.com slash episodes. I guarantee you'll find something interesting in that archive. And, of course, subscribe to the show for the next 500 episodes while you're there at tomwoods.com. The show, of course, is delivered for free every single weekday. Today, I decided I would invite onto the show two people from an institution that has done so much to shape who I am today. And that, of course, is the Mises Institute. And two people I thoroughly enjoy talking to. I know that if I just throw out a topic, we can just talk for an hour. And those two people are Lou Rockwell, of course, who is the founder and chairman of the Mises Institute, as well as the publisher of LouRockwell.com, and who was Ron Paul's first chief of staff, And Jeff Deist, the current president of the Mises Institute, who was Ron Paul's last chief of staff. Both of these gentlemen are going to join me to talk about, well, pretty much what's on our minds and what's going on with libertarianism. We're going to look, we're going to do a more or less a retrospective and prospective, retrospect and prospect as we look at the fortunes of the ideas that we believe in so strongly. So let me welcome these gentlemen to the show. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Tom, great to be with you. Well, Tom, kudos on 500 shows. You're a a font of productive activity. Well, thank you very much. I did most of the shows while I was also working on that Ron Paul curriculum, uh, ronpaulhomeschool.com thing. And I did it, actually. I started doing the show in part because I thought, this is a finite thing I can do each day where I can say, I did this. And it's a contribution I can make while I'm swamped, so people don't forget about me while I'm working on the Ron Paul curriculum for two years. (laughs) So that's actually what prompted me to do it. And now that the curriculum, at least my contribution to it, is finished, I can just enjoy the show. And, uh, and, And I have enjoyed it. I've learned an awful lot. I have a wide variety of guests. And it gives me a chance also to talk to people like you and Lou, whom I love to talk to. And we're going to talk today just as if we were sitting down to dinner together. Although, I don't know, maybe there's some things we would say at dinner that we might not say on the show. But I thought I would would start with an issue that's been on my mind, a strategic issue, that I don't feel like I've ever really gotten a good answer to, and I wonder if you guys have thought about it. A lot of times people in Mises circles will say disparaging things about the political process, and I completely sympathetic to that. We all understand what's wrong with it on a lot of different levels. But there's a part of me that doesn't really see the model of society whereby things change in the absence of politics. That, in other words, if if people are going to be confined to, you know, Mitch McConnell on the right and Hillary Clinton on the left, and that's how most people form their political philosophy by listening to these two alternatives— how do we change things if we're not actively making an effort to be part of that conversation, even if it's a corrupt conversation and the process is corrupt? How can we get out there when we're not part of that game? Well, I agree in part. 
you know, Murray Rothbard talked about this, talked about, hey, if you think you can make yourself freer or slow down the process of becoming less free through political action, you know, your local dog catcher election, knock yourself out. I guess what I resist is the idea of young people taking their time and their energy and their youth and, and going into politics with all sorts of vim and vigor because, you know, if it's something that you're passionate for or something that you're good at and you think you can make a difference, that's fine. But I would say that applies to probably 10% of people. I mean, we had a young man, and I won't say his name, but he came to Mises U two summers ago. And he's fluent in classical languages. He's, he, he's fluent in Latin and in Greek, and he's becoming fluent in Hebrew to the point where he can teach these languages at a high level, and he's only 19 or 20 years of age. So he's asking me whether he should go and join this local congressman or, or can, congressional candidate in his hometown and, and get in, involved in his campaign and help him put up yard signs because he's slightly libertarian-ish and, we, and it, you know, we need more libertarians in Congress. And I was thinking to myself, my God, you, with your talents, you could affect the, and improve the minds of so many people, that would, and that's so much more valuable to the cause of freedom than, than trying to get some guy elected to office. So, you know, that's a, a micro example, but, on the, but in the bigger picture, you know, think of the time and money that's gone into funding the GOP because they're against abortion. You know, just imagine if all those millions of dollars had actually gone to helping young girls in need who were pregnant and offering them al- alternatives. I mean, I see that as just a horrific waste of human capital. Um, so I'm not anti-politics, and I'm certainly not anti-people engaging in politics, you know, if that's what they want to do. But I would just say, is that really your best and highest use of your time? Seems to me that, uh, that uh, of course, inadvertently, but Ron Paul, not meaning to, has fooled a lot of people. Not really Ron, but his example. Uh, there are a lot of young kids who think, gee, I can be a Ron Paul. And uh, the way to be a Ron Paul is to run for Congress, uh, not to have achieved anything else, not to have uh, a long, have a long uh, ideological background um, where you become very well read in Austrian economics and, of course, medical medicine and many other subjects, uh, American history and, and uh, political philosophy. They think they can just become a congressman and they have no idea of the pressures uh, that, uh, that afflict somebody in Congress. I mean – uh, just because in uh, hundreds of years of American politics, we've had one guy who was uh, was a giant and a great example as a man and as a scholar and as a spokesman. Um, I, people shouldn't be fooled. I mean, if you're if you're a Ron Paul, you know, first of all, you'll have achieved something else. Maybe, as Jeff says, you'll be a great professor of, of uh, classical languages. But you'll there'll be you'll have achieved things in your life, and you won't just be a young guy who wants to get into politics. And uh, I, I should say that when I was a teenager, I thought it'd be the greatest thing in the world to be a uh, congressional aide. It's a terrible thing to admit that that was actually my ambition. And of course, I eventually became a congressional aide, but in a very unusual way, I got to work for Ron Paul. Of course, Jeff uh, uh, was Ron's chief of staff too. So, um, but that doesn't count. Uh, most, of the, most, most of the rest of my like Boehner, and it's all, it's not only corrupt, it really is. Uh, it's evil. So, uh, and it's absolutely true. If you know, if you want, if people want to vote, if they want to be involved in politics, yeah. But uh, I remember once in a, in a video, when Murray's getting off a bus and he's uh, being asked, or maybe he's getting on a bus, asked um, uh, in a man in the street interview about uh, who is he going to vote for, and he says something, something. Wait, what are you crazy? Of course, I don't vote. It's just you know, it's a waste of time. So that was you know, that was his view. On the other hand, he was interested in politics, as I think uh, all three of us are. Uh, he certainly followed elections and, in fact, knew everything about every election that was going on in the country and oftentimes in the world. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, as one uh, – again, Roth, Rothbard was not – that was not his key thing in life. He was, a, first of all, a genius, a great scholar uh, in many, many different disciplines. I mean, a world historic scholar. Um, so I don't think we can – you certainly want to try to emulate a man like Rothbard to the extent you can, but nobody, I think, should be quite so arrogant as to think they can actually copy him. Same with Ron Paul. Uh, maybe there'll be another Ron Paul at some point. Uh, be nice to think about it, but there's nobody yet. There's no sign of anybody yet. 
And it seems to me the, the proof is in the, uh, you know, of, of anybody who gets involved in politics, they become part of the problem. They're not carrying the banner of liberty on uh, the Capitol Hill. Uh, they, they become the enemy. And they fool people, as Jeff says, get people to – the Republican Party, of course, couldn't care less about pro-life issues. They just roll it out every four years to raise money and then put it away again. Uh, and that's, of course, true of issue after issue. They're part – you, as Tom, you always point out, right? They're all speaking from the same three-by-five card of a received opinion. Republicans, Democrats, everybody. There are no good guys on Capitol Hill. Yes, there might be some who are slightly less bad than others. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, but can you actually look for our salvation in any sense to that bunch of crooks and clowns and, of course, corruptionists? And it's true at the city council and it's true in the county level government, state government, federal government. Uh, if uh, now the U.S. is the world empire, it's you know, true in, in spades. So no um, – so if, you know, if, if, if somebody wants, has the vocation to run for office, they want to do it. And they have also, by the way, Ron Paul's natural political ability – this is a, maybe it seemed like a terrible thing to say about Ron. He's a great politician. He knows how to appeal to people. He knows how to talk to people. In his early congressional uh, elections, he would wear out, literally wear out, multiple pairs of shoes walking neighborhoods and talking to people. He loved trying to convince people. He loved building coalitions. He loved getting people interested. You have to have that kind of ability too, by the way. I want to get back to politics actually in a minute, but – it occurred to me that when we look in uh, Austrian economics, the history of Austrian economics in the 20th century, of course you have the towering figure of Mises himself, and then you had I mean, Mises died in 73, and then you had Rothbard at the same time, and then later, because uh, Rothbard lived another you know 22 years, and Rothbard was the dominant figure at that point. Today, we have some very smart people and some very bright young scholars coming through, but we don't have a Rothbard. We don't have one figure who so dominates the landscape by his sheer brilliance and the sheer volume of his output. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? How do you evaluate that? Well, I think it's a good thing in that the, the movement is broader, it's more diversified, it's more global. Um, you know, you take someone like Hoppe, who certainly has the mental agility of a Rothbard. He sort of chose to go down a path, um, you know, more interested in philosophy and ethics and, and the nature of governance. So he, he wasn't a, he's not a pure economist per se. Um, but you have so many names now. You have, you know, Joe Salerno is really the dean of Austrian monetary theory today and still a young guy. Um, you know, you have people like Philip Bogus and Guido Halsman who lead the European contingent, uh, tremendous interest in growth in Asia and the Far East in, in Austrian ideas, tremendous interest in growth in the Middle East in Austrian ideas. So I would say it's a problem of abundance. It's just harder today for one figure to stand out because there's so many channels of communication. There's so much social media, so many websites, so many opportunities um, to hear about Austrian economics at 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, you know, you were lucky if you could find a, 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 a Mises book at, uh, at Walden Books or whatever. So I see this as a good thing, not a bad thing. That's, that's my perspective anyway. Well, I think it's a good thing too. And also speaking about being fooled, we've sort of been fooled. We've sort of, uh, and of course, been blessed by having these two world historic geniuses one after another. Uh, but this is pretty unusual in the history of thought. So if we think of sort of, you know, the opposition, uh, there's only been one Keynes. Nobody has come anywhere near close to Keynes's brilliance uh, since the death of Keynes. Oh, good point. Uh, and the people who are prominent, you know, the Paul Krugmans, your favorite guy, um, and, and similar Paul Samuelson and so forth, are big because of their connections to the state, not because they're brilliant, creative economists. Of course, in, uh, he, uh, Keynes had the brilliant uh, creativity of the devil. Um, there's only one Karl Marx. That, hasn't, that didn't stop communism for a very long time. So, uh, and, but as Jeff is right, there's a vast, I can tell you, as compared to the beginnings of the Mises Institute, there's a vast increase in the uh, interest in Austrian economics all around the world, not only by young scholars and scholars of all ages, uh, but by uh, business people and, and uh, professionals and journalists. And uh, we're still obviously very much a minority school, but we are so much huger a minority than we used to be. It's just very, very encouraging. This was basically my view of, of the question. I will add one quick thing, because tomorrow 
September 30th, 2015, if you can believe it, is National Podcast Day. <laughs> now, I know you all have your own ways of celebrating that, and it would be, you know, it's wrong of me to interfere in your private celebrations. However, it, it's, it so happens that that's the day that Bob Murphy and I are launching Contra Krugman, hey. our podcast, yeah, our weekly podcast where we're going to refute Paul Krugman's column every week, and in doing so, teach economics. It's not just to go after one person. And the reason we're going after him is not that, you know, although he's a very bright guy, it's not that he's a world historic genius, but because he is, for better or worse, the American representative of Keynesianism. But we're going to have a lot of fun doing that, and it just goes to show that the technology that's available to us is so astonishing that we, Bob and I, who the New York Times would consider nothing but peons, nevertheless are the equals of Krugman in that we can get our message out too with a very small investment of money in equipment and do this week after week after week. And, of course, we're going to pretend that we planned it to premiere on National Podcast Day, but could you imagine Bob Murphy and I being on top of things enough to have done that on purpose? But anyway, that's going to happen tomorrow, and the website is ContraKrugman.com. That hadn't been grabbed by anybody, so we grabbed it. All right, let's go. Uh, you know, I'm just jump. going to mention, Tom, one thing that you're going to have going for you, from everything I know about Krugman, this is not directly, this is indirectly, but I have some pretty good information. He will be driven absolutely crazy by I your know. podcast. <laughs> He's going to respond to you. He's going to be driven crazy. So just that alone is a great uh, public service. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I know it. I know. Absolutely. All right. Uh, let's jump back into politics for a minute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to upset some of my listeners who don't want to talk about politics. But, you know, the best listened to episodes of the show are – you and I, Lou, talking about politics and the debates, by far. That's what people are, are interested in. Not because they love politics, but because they love our analysis, apparently. Well, in particular, of course, we've paid a lot of attention to the candidacy of Donald Trump. And I, I just want to say a little something about this and get your thoughts. When I look at Donald Trump supporters in particular, um, I can't stand them, and yet I kind of understand them. At the same time, I, what I understand about them is they're responding to somebody who just won't back down. And it's so unusual to see that. And somebody who won't allow people to shut him up, even if he talks about issues he's not supposed to talk about. He just brushes them aside. He hits back hard. He defends himself when he's being, when he's, uh, being interviewed. And not just with talking points. I mean, he hits really hard. And he's, he's on top of things. He, if somebody on Twitter is attacking him, bam, he smashes you. People <laughs> are attracted to this because mostly we have these girly men, mealy-mouthed nobodies. And so that is what is attra- and I, you know, and, and I find that to be quite entertaining and, and that aspect of his character to be quite admirable. But on the other hand, what enrages me about his supporters is they seem to think that what we need is just a strong guy. Right now, we just need a strong man who's strong-willed, who's a businessman, who has business experience, and he'll come in and turn things around. And it's just disappointing to me that after eight years of education under Obama, education, in other words, through experience, hard experience, learning something of the nature of the state, they seem to have learned nothing. What they've learned is Obama's a Muslim. He's, he must be the only pro-gay marriage Muslim in the history of the world, but Obama's a Muslim, and he sides with the terrorists, and so we need a better guy in there. I can't believe the conservative movement is that pathetic that after eight years, that's what their followers have to show for what they've gotten out of this? So, okay, so I, I invite your comments on anything I just said. Well, maybe the conservative movement, such as it is, is that pathetic. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I would just say this about Trump. He's made some bad mistakes in, in recent weeks um, in responding to people in, in ways that suggest he's starting to fall into the abyss. He's starting to respond in ways that show he's playing the game. And his next hurdle is going to be the, the need for a so-called ground game in those early primary states. And none of this is really his forte. His forte is obviously uh, in creating visual events and public speaking and, and ha- you know, the art of the comeback. Um, that's really his forte. But what I don't get 
is this neoconservative hatred for him. Of course, we all know the real reason um, is that he's not sufficiently uh, where they would probably want him to be on, on matters of war and peace. Although I do notice that, that the un-PC Donald Trump becomes rather PC on the subject of one particular Democratic ally country <laughs> in the Middle East. All of a sudden, he becomes very politically correct. Uh, you're, but, you're talking about Lebanon, of yes, course, right? <laughs> yes, I'm, t- I'm talking about Lebanon, but... Uh, he, to me, he is he ought to symbolize the neoconservative dream. This is what they have agitated for throughout the 20th century, the imperial executive, a strong man who will make the trains run on time. It, you know, these guys, the Bill Crystals of the world, have outed themselves as, as milk toasts. I mean, these guys are so uh, uh, threatened by a guy who's masculine, by a guy who's not PC – by a guy who's not in and of the beltway or in and of elite circles, that it just drives them crazy because they, he came out of nowhere, they didn't anoint him, and he's made, he's made huge headway. So they can't stomach this. So if nothing else, Trump has given us the tremendous gift of upsetting the apple cart of political consultants who are loathsome creatures and also of, of doing serious damage to that monster Jeb Bush. I mean, he's put a real dagger into that guy's campaign and electability. So, um, you know, to all of his left libertarian critics, all I would say is, yeah, so what? Where are your criticisms of Hillary? Where are your criticisms of Carly Fiorina, who ne- apparently has never met a country she doesn't want to bomb? You know, I, I'm not a Trump fan, but I'm really suspicious of this knee-jerk impulse amongst left libertarians to treat him as, as a monster when they yeah, don't exactly. treat, when, when they don't when treat the know. others. We know for a fact Fiorina's going to war. We know that for a fact. Whereas at least with Trump, there's a possibility he won't because he's not owned and he's not an ideologue. I mean, now, uh, part of me feels like one of his problems is he's not enough of a good ideologue, but he doesn't seem to have much of an ideology other than I can work with people, I can make deals. Maybe that would be marginally better. I mean, let's forget about all the reasons you might hate Trump. For, forget, pretend his name was Joe Smith. And, and you knew that he was a businessman, and you knew that he thought the Iraq war was extremely destabilizing, and so on and on, you would say, well, you know, he's probably still a bum, but there's a 3% chance he'll be better than the people who are pounding, the, pounding their fists on the table saying, you know, war, war, war. Well, the neocons have certainly come to expect that they can own the candidate. So here's a guy they don't own and doesn't need them and doesn't need their money. So that's a very frightening to them. Um, it really, I don't think, has anything to do with his particular ideology, although they definitely don't like having a masculine candidate. The rest of these guys are all metrosexuals. So it's, it's, uh, that's, you know, that's bothersome. They also don't like somebody who has had, and again, this is a secret to his success besides his personality, vast achievements outside of politics. Vast achievements. So uh, that's, of course, a, that's what everybody loves about him. He's a rich businessman. And it, it's, a, it's a healthy thing that it shows that Americans are still, by and large, not envy-driven. People don't envy Donald Trump as money. It says something very good about his supporters and, and just probably Americans in general. Uh, but he's, you know, the other thing, but the unfortunate thing is you can't ever trust anybody who wants power. So as soon as, as Jeff points out, you know, as soon as these guys get a smell of power, the taste of power, um, you can't trust them. So uh, only Ron Paul of anybody I've ever been aware of, clearly did not want power over other people's lives. Not only did he say it, but you believed him, and it's true. The way he runs his own life, uh, and he's, not, he's not power mad. That makes him maybe not unique in the history of the world, but pretty unusual. Gentlemen, let's pause for just a moment to thank our sponsor. Hey, everybody, I know you like listening to podcasts and to libertarian ones in particular. Well, I'm very glad to recommend to you the Jason Stapleton program, hosted by my friend Jason Stapleton. He runs Monday through Friday as well at jasonstapleton.com, and he has a 10-episode challenge. So that's two weeks. If you'll listen for two weeks, you'll walk away better informed, more knowledgeable, and better equipped to challenge both progressives and conservatives. No more being silent when the subjects of politics or economics come up. You'll know how to articulate what you believe with confidence. Jason's goal is to teach the value of individual liberty and economic freedom through current events. 
And so for a full hour, five days a week, Jason will cover the current political and economic news from a libertarian perspective. Jason was recently picked up by the USA Radio Network, making him one of the only nationally syndicated libertarian radio show hosts in America. So check out the Jason Stapleton program at jasonstapleton.com. I want to talk about the, I hate the word movement, but I can't think of anything else to say. And I'm talking about the libertarian movement in terms of people who agree with us, like our brand of libertarianism. As you look at it in 2015, where do you think we're excelling, and where would you say we need more work? Well, I think Trump shows us that that populism is very dangerous. Populism is a double-edged sword. Um, So when you talk about our brand of libertarianism, I always hope that if nothing else— The Mises Institute stands for a very strong ideological and intellectual core to one's libertarian perspective, as opposed to this sort of breezy, social media-driven, you know, pick up your ideology like you pick up a a box of cereal at the grocery store. I I don't like that kind of libertarianism that's not intellectual at its core. Um, That being said, you know, the way to appeal to the masses— Uh, to be a populist is probably not to ask them to read 900 odd pages of human action, right? It's just not the world we live in today. And I think as a result of that, if we want to stay true to our principles and if we want to have actual effect, you know, I very much believe just look at mainline Protestant churches, you know, when they water down their message, look what happens to them. They get extinct, Okay, I, I very strongly believe that that applies to the Liberty Movement and to the Mises Institute. I think that movement libertarianism is a non-starter. I think libertarian populism is a dangerous, dangerous idea. And I think we need to really stick to our principles and actually become more popular, not less popular, by our intransigence. Because at the end of the day, people are looking for something understandable. They're looking for something that makes sense. They're looking for something that's that's consistent. But, you know, we, we make a mistake when we think that they're looking for something easy. The answers to our problems are not easy. Um, they're simple, but they're not easy. So I'm very proud to sort of stand on that wing of libertarianism that, that argues for purity. I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I think it's our strength. And ultimately, I think it's our best selling point, the opposite of, let's say, what the Rand Paul contingent would argue. You know, it's interesting if we look at what's happened in this election, one of the things that has uh, been shown is super PACs are not very effective. Uh, it's hilarious to see that the guys who took the biggest falls in the New Hampshire polls just recently, uh, Bush and uh, Lindsey Graham, are the ones who have been running huge amounts of ads in New Hampshire. Actually makes people dislike them more. <laughs> so it's uh, uh, the Cokes. Um, <clears throat> the Sheldon Adelsons of the world and so forth. Turns out they actually are not anywhere near as powerful politically as they thought themselves to be. Um, it's actually possible for ideas to trump uh, pressure groups and special interests. And um, so I think, uh, uh, and of course, we have, what an extraordinary um, uh, body of ideas we have that we're so blessed to um, to have to teach and to try to expand and to, uh, and young people are interested in it, and we're helped by the fact that what's going on in colleges and universities is so ridiculous, so nihilistic, so horrendous, so PC, and so forth, that smart young kids are ready for something different. And uh, the Mises Institute has got that something different, and based on all the great scholars, and we also, you know, Mises always felt um, that economics was too important to be left to the economists. So it's a very, we've always sought to reach out to regular people, too. Um, this is, of course, ideas for people with a brain. So it's not for every single human being, uh, but it is. But we don't. You don't. We don't need every single human being. We only need a, a dedicated and motivated minority, and we're building that. And uh, it's a long-term struggle. But as, as uh, I mentioned, Trump again, things can happen very quickly uh, if the right if the right uh, formula is in existence when. People are ready to change. Really, Rothbard always used to emphasize this, that uh, the climate of opinion can change almost overnight uh, when the circumstances are right. So that should give us hope. Um, not that I think Trump is our ideological guy. He's not, although he does some good stuff. He does some bad stuff. Um, I hope nobody is president myself, of course. So I don't, uh, um, don't want to see him in the White House and 
I don't want to see any of these people in the White House. But the more that we can point people away from the White House, away from politics, as interesting as it is to me too, um, and towards the eternal things, the permanent things, um, that's, our, that's our success. Well, before I go on to the next thing, I want to add to this in terms of where we might need work. It's, I mean, there are a lot of things that I could think of, but I'm kind of surprised that if I look at 2010 and compare it to 2015, and I say, who are the people, if you were thinking about libertarian thinkers, writers, commentators, that who just occur to you off the top of your head, it's pretty much the same names from as five years ago as compared to today. And I guess I would have expected there to be more of a flowering of a whole bunch of new names, and I haven't yet seen that. I mean, little by little here and there I see it, but not to the extent I expected. L- let me ask you this. Suppose you're, you're, you've met a, a young person who's just getting interested in libertarianism in general and says, the libertarian world is just so big, I don't know what to make of all of it. I don't know who's who. I've got the Libertarian Party. I've got D.C. think tanks. I've got this, that, and the other thing. Uh, now, I realize, you know, we want to be as charitable as possible, and maybe there are things we wouldn't say on a podcast, but how would you guide them through that? Uh, what would you say about the libertarian landscape? Well, I would say it's it's a very dangerous one, because um, if you get pulled into what I'll call lifestyle or movement libertarianism, um, you may find your time, especially your youth, spent in engaging in things that are not, uh, that, that are not profitable to your life. Um, I really suggest to younger people that they develop a talent or an interest or a, a, an occupation first and foremost. I mean, I think for most people, certainly I always thought this of myself, um, libertarianism, libertarianism is going to be a hobby rather than a career. And, and that's probably best um, for most people. So, you know, this idea of, of uh, getting pulled into a libertarian ghetto is something that I think young people ought to resist. And I think we ought to resist it as a movement because the point is to be engaged. The point is to create a bourgeois libertarianism that, that just average people, average businessmen and businesswomen uh, subscribe to. If we're this sort of isolated, ghettoized movement off to one side that seems faintly weird to people, um, then it doesn't take a propaganda expert to understand that we won't be successful. I would love to see a day where one's libertarianism is as uh, innocuous a feature as, you know, one's religious preference. In other words, you have a neighbor who's a Catholic or or you have a neighbor who's a Protestant. I I mean, I think libertarianism should be a feature of of, um, popular, happy, successful people in the world, as opposed to a lifestyle or a movement where one goes to seek shelter amongst a bunch of other people hammering away on the internet all day. Um, it should be woven into, into the fabric of our social and business lives. That's the way I see it, Tom. Tom, I think you know, what I always tell young people, and, and uh, I know we all do this, is read. You've got to read. You can't just come into this and you've heard a speech or you've read an article. You've got to read the great books. Um, read, 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 read for your whole life, but you've, you've, got, to, you've got to start with that. Uh, and then my advice would be stay away from the Libertarian Party. Um, it's ideologically pretty much a sellout operation. There are some good people in it, but uh, they're the minority. I mean, the guy who was the nominee the last time um, is pretty much a statist and a warmonger. Um, that's been true for some time, uh, especially since, of course, the death of Rothbard. As to the Beltway think tanks, they're all funded by uh, the Koch brothers. And the Koch brothers uh, are libertarian-ish. Uh, they sort of uh, talk about their – first of all, they're left libertarians, so they promote lifestyle libertarianism. And they promote palling around with the state, allegedly in order to um, um, move the state in our direction. I'm sure getting more oil contracts in Iraq and so forth have nothing to do with it. Uh, but I would say you know, the, the, it's one of the unfortunate things that happens, that has happened to the libertarian movement, the amount of money – the Koch brothers have put into it. They've warped it. And uh, it's, it's, um, it's a very different kind of libertarianism. So I echo what Jeff said about staying away from those people. But I would just say the, the, the beginning um, has to be reading, 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 reading. Read Rothbard, read Mises, read Woods, read uh, uh, so all the great books. I mean, there's so many great books. In a lifetime, we're not going to, you know, the average person or even a very smart person is never going to be able to get through everything. 
but you can certainly get through 10 or 20 key books that makes you, first of all, far above anybody else or most people you're going to encounter in terms of what you know and what you're able to think and how you're able to build on that foundation. Uh, I think that's, that's the key to being a serious libertarian. I will link on the show notes page, which is tomwoods.com slash 500, to some books that, uh, Lou, you've recommended in the past and your guide to reading Rothbard, and I'll put all that up there. I guess as we uh, wrap things up, I-, I wonder, is there anything over the past, maybe in your whole career, I might even ask it that way, I was just thinking the past 10 years, but is there a particular memory that you have from your life basically as a libertarian in the public eye that is that you cherish especially uh, strongly. Like, for instance, for me, it really is that rally for the Republic in 2008 in uh, Minneapolis to see that many people coming to cheer for Ron. Now, he wound up getting crowds like that in the 2012 campaign almost at the drop of a hat. We couldn't have known that was going to happen. But it was so thrilling to see him get that recognition. And then also, Lou, you know, for you and I to be able to address a crowd like that that when you mentioned Rothbard's name, they cheered like crazy. It really made me think, wow, something has happened that I could never have anticipated, and I will never, ever forget that moment. Well, I guess I'd, re- I'd remember uh, uh, an evening in 1968. Um, I'd been had the great honor of being Mises' uh, editor, bringing back some of his books into print and a new monograph in the historical setting of the Austrian school. And so Leonard Reed was... was um, putting on a, an, an evening in honor of these publications. And uh, um, so I got my tray. You waited in line to get your, get your dinner. I got my tray, went into the dining room, and uh, uh, there at the only table occupied were Ludwig and Margaret von Mises. So I had talked to Mises on the phone. I'd spent a good deal of amount of time with Margaret on the phone. Um, so I, I thought, do I dare go over there? And I said, what are you kidding? Of course you have to. So to... Um, I've had the chance to have dinner with Mises. Um, that's just, you know, obviously one of the great moments of my life, very inspiring. And uh, he was um, uh, older at that time, um, but still um, such a great gentleman, so beautifully dressed, beautiful manners. Um, I always love what Murray said about, uh, about him, that he was a gentleman of an older and a better time, that he came out of the uh, pre-war Vienna, really 19th century Vienna, of course. Uh, and um, he just was a great gentleman. Uh, nothing like, uh, if we think of some, some of the libertarians we've been talking about today, including their leaders, <laughs> nothing like that. We don't think to ourselves, my goodness, they're so well-dressed and so gentlemanly. <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, the fact that I got the chance to talk to him um, will always, always be in my mind as just one of the great blessings of my life. All right, Jeff, you have the final word here. Well, Tom, I would have to say that just becoming personally close with Ron and Carol Paul has been a joy for me. You know, I first met him in 1988 when I was in college and he was running for the Libertarian Party nomination. Um, And through staying in touch with him and knowing him and Carol all these years, I mean, I've been privy to so many great dinners and meetings with people like Jim Grant. I've gotten to meet people like like uh, Kane, Glenn Jacobs. I've gotten to meet just an astonishing amount of people over the years, Pat Buchanan, you name it, um, in the libertarian world and in the faintly conservative world. Um, I- I've just been able to hear so many great conversations and, and enjoy so many evenings. And, and really, I owe it all to Ron Paul because he called me out of the blue um, and asked me to come work on his congressional staff. So it's uh, it's been uh, something I, I couldn't have expected or planned, but uh, I, I'm thrilled to have known him. And I do think that history will treat him much better than his uh, uh, congressional colleagues and this uh, servile media we have today will treat him. I think history will treat him as, as a man of peace and, and as someone who, who shook the world. Well, Jeff and Lou, I'm really grateful that you both joined me today for this special 500th episode, sort of a retrospective and prospective as we look back and look to the future. Jeff, I support everything you're doing at the Mises Institute. I couldn't be happier with what's going on there. And Lou, if you hadn't found the Mises Institute, I honestly don't know where I would be today. It, it, it really shaped me into who I am. Remember, as of the early 1990s, I was a middle-of-the-road GOPer. Who, who thought that, well, maybe we should cut spending a little bit, but we definitely have to go to war. Like, that was my worldview. 
and it was shaken to its core because I went to the Mises University program. So I can't tell you how how indebted I am to you and how much respect I have for, for you two gentlemen and how important the work of the Mises Institute is. And it's so important in my life that I thought I would highlight it by featuring uh, you two gentlemen on this uh, milestone episode. So thanks so much for your time. Tom, let me just mention one thing about you. Uh, I will never forget when you first came to the Institute, you were a sophomore, um, and as I got to know you, I thought, this kid's a star, and he's going to be somebody who's going to achieve great things. And I was right. That's very kind of you to say. I, I certainly appreciate that. Well, again, thanks so much for your time. I think this was a wonderful conversation. We should do it more often. And uh, look forward to seeing you down in Auburn one of these days soon. Wonderful. Thanks, Tom. And that is episode 500. Check out the show notes page at tomwoods.com slash 500, where I will link to some resources and books that you might want to read if you have been inspired by this episode to get out there and read. Do some more reading to learn more about these ideas. Tomorrow we continue with the show. We get into the second 500 episodes with episode 501 with Pierre Desrochers, who is going to talk to us about the 25th anniversary of the famous bet between Julian Simon and Paul Ehrlich. If you have not heard of this, it's because you're too darn young to remember it. But I'll make a long story short. This was a debate that basically centered around are things getting better or things getting worse? Are mineral resources and other resources that we need going to get scarcer, or are we going to figure out how to conserve these resources and come up with substitutes? Will the human mind be able to cope with the challenges of a growing population? These kind of things were at the heart of this debate, and they debated, or they, they had a bet regarding five commodities that Ehrlich was allowed to choose. He could choose them. He's the one who thinks things are going to get worse. And if their prices have gone down, inflation adjusted, if their prices have gone down in 10 years, then he would owe Simon $1,000. But if they've gone up, Simon owes him $1,000. Well, they all went down, and Simon won the bet. So we'll talk about that bet and what it means tomorrow. Thanks so much for listening, for all your support. I really, really appreciate it. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.